Thank you all so much for um, coming tonight. And I really do hope that you guys can potentially learn um, a little bit of um, what I've learned over the past five or six years um, doing this kind of stuff. Um, I'm going to start by just sharing my screen because I do have um, slides. Um, here we go. Okay. Yes. So um, essentially today we're going to be talking um, a lot about kind of the democratic institutions and the ways that you can kind of participate in civic life um, and kind of how you can use that to essentially um, advocate for climate justice at kind of a government level. Um, so this is something that um, is pretty key to Generation Zero. Um, I'll just give a wee kind of uh, brief overview. So um, for those who don't know, Generation Zero is a youth-led organisation and we mobilise New Zealanders to engage in decision-making and campaigning for um, climate justice. So primarily we kind of look into like things like energy, um, transport, housing and kind of like broader climate change um, policies and plans. And so we started in 2011 and we have done a whole bunch of campaigns around getting people to vote for climate um, in 2014 and also um, the Zero Carbon Act and um, also a lot of RMA stuff currently. And we also do stuff at the local government level, making sure that we are influencing the decisions to make sure that climate justice is at the very least considered in their plans. Um, so yeah, our kind of biggest campaign to date was the Zero Carbon Act. Um, and that was slightly different to um, kind of our general day-to-day -day engaging in civic action. But um, I did just want to highlight it in the sense that um, we're going to be talking a lot today about like legal processes and how laws are made and stuff like that. Um, but it is entirely possible for a group of young people to just kind of um, get together and mobilize and um, to achieve like this kind of scale of action. So it is really possible. And I do really want to stress like throughout this uh, workshop that like a lot of the stuff, it seems really daunting, but it is really achievable and it is um, very easy to kind of mobilize around this kind of stuff. If, um, you know, hopefully um, the politicians listen. Um, and wait a second. Okay. Um, so kind of who are our decision makers and how do we influence them? So a lot of our decision makers are democratically elected, um, which is why it is important to vote. And um, when, but once they get in there, there are kind of certain processes by which they make decisions on our behalf. And these can range from um, consultations with ministries and councils to um, select committees in the legislative um, process. And um, what's really key there though, is that um, they're there to represent us. So, we have ample opportunity to lobby them and to have our say on kind of the proposals and the laws that they want to enact. Um, so, obviously, so, so we obviously have kind of MPs and I assume that most people kind of understand what members of parliament are and um, how they kind of get into that position. Once they're there, they, um, one of their key tasks is to pass laws. And so um, Parliament in New Zealand is the kind of democratic institution that passes our laws. Um, there are a number of types of laws that get passed. Um, the first example is a government bill. So um, the government of the day generally has like a legislative agenda of all the kind of laundry list of laws that they would like to amend or pass. 
and um, so they can um, table a government bill according to their legislative agenda. Um, a bill is just kind of like a baby law that hasn't been passed, sorry. Um, there are also members bills. So any member of parliament can um, submit a bill and as a quirk of New Zealand's democracy, um, they get put in a little biscuit tin and every so often when there's time in the proceedings, they'll take a couple of out to debate them and table them in the house. The third type is a local bill. Um, so a local bill is generally instigated by like a local authority, so like your district or city council. And usually it's really specific to like local issues, but they um, are pretty powerful tools if you um, want to kind of make your particular city um, change its way and center climate justice at some, in some sort of way. And the kind of final one, which is super rare, are private bills. Um, they generally deal with like really, really, really specific issues dealing to like one person or one organization. Um, and yeah, uh, they're not exactly the most effective tool. So probably just kind of ignore them a little bit. But once- then Could I just interrupt there? Maggie's asking if that's for real and if it's really a biscuit tin. Yes, it is for real. Um, and it really is a biscuit tin. Um, you can Google it. It's like, yeah, just Google like parliament biscuit tin and it should come up. The members bills biscuit tin, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> way to go democracy, right? Um, yeah, so anyway, once you've kind of got your bill, it gets tabled in parliament. And um, so it then goes through the legislative process. The legislative process starts with the first reading where essentially the bill's tabled and parliament decides and votes on whether they essentially agree to proceed with it, debate it. It's not um, a vote of um, any significance, really. It's not going to change a law in and of itself, or um, you know, it might not be the exact bill that passes in the end, but it's just an indication that, they, yep, we're absolutely going to do this. Once that happens, it then gets referred to a relevant select committee. Select committees are made up of MPs, usually representing um, the parties in parliament. And then, so there's like, um, often like one or two green MPs or um, an ACT MP and then a couple of um, Labour MPs and a couple of New Zealand First MPs and a couple of national MPs on them. Um, and so what happens at the select committee process is that they are tasked with writing a report and a number of recommendations on essentially improvements to the bill that could be made before it gets passed. Um, select committees as part of this do public consultations often and they're an opportunity for everyone to have their say on how they would like something to be improved. Um, they can do it in writing and then also if they're feeling a bit confident they can also um, do a, a hearing with the select committee and um, speak to their submission. Um, and it's a really key opportunity often to like have your say on um, a lot of decisions that are made around climate justice. After the select committee reports back to the house um, or parliament, it then goes to a second reading. And the second reading essentially um, kind of notes where things are at and then moves it to the committee of the whole house after a vote. The committee of the whole house is essentially where they debate it clause by clause. So um, that's the opportunity for MPs to add in supplementary order papers. So those are essentially like proposed amendments to the bill that they would like to be put in there and they get debated clause by clause. And by the end, you get to the third reading, which is everything that everyone has agreed to. And they call a final vote on whether MPs want to um, pass the bill into law. And if it passes, then it's essentially law at that point. But there is one constitutional kind of, um, I guess, like final step, which is that technically 
the parliament needs to give it to the governor general to get royal assent before it gets made a law. Um, question uh, to the select committees. Is there an age limit um, at which people can speak at them? No, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, voting is the only part of the kind of civic and democratic process that there is an age limit to. Um, in addition to kind of the laws that government makes and parliament makes, there are a whole bunch of rules and bylaws and national policy statements and regulations and district plans that get made. And they're not laws per se, but they are rules that kind of need to be followed. And so, um, for example, uh, your local council probably has drinking bylaws around like the sale of alcohol or their district plan will um, kind of say when and where, um, or like where, you know, apartment buildings can be built or where industrial um, kind of buildings can be built and where like kind of farmland should be. Um, in addition to this, there's like regulations. So a really good example, a recent example of this is the most recent freshwater regulations, which kind of um, puts rules around like how much nitrate can be um, released into our waterways. And then there are also national policy statements, which essentially um, kind of set a clear direction um, for a particular thing. Um, that could be anything from how we should have a mode shift from cars to more public and active types of transport, or it could be something along the lines of um, instructing that renewable energy, small community renewable energy projects should be consented or something like that. Um, which kind of brings to local government they kind of count a lot more than you think they do. They make a lot of decisions about our kind of day-to-day -day lives that um, impact us quite um, significantly. So regional councils and district and city councils are kind of two different entities. Uh, they deal with kind of different things, but regional councils are kind of in charge of reporting on the environment and um, you know, implementing the, I guess, national regulations um, or like enforcing the national regulations for um, fresh water, for example. Whereas um, district and city councils um, are tasked with other things such as maintaining local roads and providing libraries and um, other kind of public amenities. Um, there are also other institutions where um, essentially you, the government can be held to account and they can also be really good allies and people to be in contact with in terms of um, making sure that the government is actually doing um, kind of substantive action on climate justice. So the first example of this is the Climate Change Commission. So the Climate Change Commission was established by the Zero Carbon Act. And before that, there was an interim Climate Change Commission for about a year. And essentially what the Climate Change Commission does is it holds the government to account for all of the obligations that they've made um, under the Zero Carbon Act. They provide independent evidence-based advice and kind of um, are there to kind of inform the government on a number of things. Some really good examples of that are that um, the Climate Change Commission is going to make recommendations on the 10-year carbon budgets that are prescribed in the Zero Carbon Act. Essentially, that will kind of determine the rate at which our climate emissions go down. Um, they are also an opportunity to um, have your say because they do go out to public consultation 
and the first three budgets are going to be out for consultation either I I suppose at the end of this year but with COVID I wouldn't be surprised if it gets a little bit delayed um, Another example of something that the Climate Change Commission is going to give recommendations on and that should have a good opportunity to have your say through public consultation is um, the inclusion of aviation and shipping emissions in our carbon budgets, which is a super technical policy point, but is also kind of important. Um, and the Climate Change Commission can also make reports and evidence um, if the minister requests it um, under this, yeah, under the climate change response bill. Um, so here's a kind of nice picture of our current um, climate change commission. It's got the chairperson um, Rod Carr, and um, there are currently yeah five members. James Shaw is not included in there. He's the um, minister for climate change. Sorry, Jen, I've just got a few questions around that. So one of them is sort of what is the, um, I guess with the election coming up, what is the role of the Climate Change Commission um, for the next 10, 20, 30 years? So assuming um, that we do have some other parties gaining power again, um, can the Climate uh, Change Commission overrule them? Um, and also does the Climate Change Commission um, have a say for local councils? So um, in response to the first question, so kind of the whole idea of the Climate Change Commission was to make sure that um, plans and reports and advice is given to a high quality, no matter who is in power at any one given time. So um, the Climate Change Commission can't force the government to do anything, but they can table reports that will be publicly available which will say say for example someone's in power they're not doing what's required to meet our emissions targets to keep um, warming to 1.5 degrees celsius then they can table a report saying this is how we're going to um, fail our targets and our budgets and here are our recommendations of what you need to change in order to um, meet those targets and budgets. And in respect to the second question, um, they're primarily focused on um, reporting back to the House of Representatives to Parliament, but um, of course, a lot of the advice, especially around um, adaptation planning, will be really critical advice for um, local government to take. Cool. And then I also uh, noticed that somebody um, raised the question why there was no young people in the Climate Change Commission. Um, is that something that frustrates you or that you think is okay? Um, I think I'd definitely like to see a lot more young people there, um, but I will give them credit in the sense that I believe that they're um, doing better at consulting with youth and um, they are definitely very open to that and I would encourage um, all youth groups to hit them up and be like, hey, do you want to hear our voice? Are there any further questions? No, cool. Um, so another example of an institution that you could get to kind of help um, hold government to account is the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. So this position was set up under the Environment Act. And essentially what the commissioner is there to do is to do independent reporting and advice on environmental issues. Um, so section 13 of the Environmental Act, Environment Act um, sets out a number of things that um, the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment can do. For example, um, they can review our processes for resource management systems, um, investigate any matter where the environment um, may be or could be adversely affected, 
um, they can write reports um, on request from the House or Select Committee. And those can be on a lot, a range of things. For example, they could be asked to report on a bill or they could also be asked to report on a petition. So it might be something just to keep in mind, um, maybe for the next petition that you submit to Parliament is to see if part of that could be asking the Parliamentary Commission for the Environment to um, kind of do a lot of research and investigation into the issue that you are um, trying to raise. Um, in addition to that, they, um, uh, the commissioner and the commission is tasked with collecting information about the environment and um, kind of highlighting issues and um, encouraging preventative measures to environmental harm. The current Climate Change Commissioner is Simon Upton, um, who was a national MP um, a a, when I was a very small toddler. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, another key one in terms of um, an institution that provides advice but is also where a lot of the consultation or who will run a lot of the consultations that I've kind of mentioned, the opportunities to have your say, is the Ministry for the Environment. Um, they do a lot of work around um, our national policy statements and um, particular regulations that um, might be needed to kind of centre climate justice and a whole range of other kind of environmental issues. Um, other um, ministries do get involved and other government agencies are involved. For example, um, uh, a lot of our energy um, and resource kind of oil and, and those kinds of um, matters get dealt with by the Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment often. Um, and, you know, things that directly impact climate justice and things like transport poverty would be dealt with by um, the New Zealand Transport Agency, for example. So they're just the most prominent, but they're definitely not the only ministry that's going to be dealing with kind of the day-to-day -day climate justice issues that we're kind of grappling with. Um, so now we're going to do a bit of a breakout group exercise. I am going to continue talking on for a just a little bit, just to explain a little bit of the background. And um, hopefully you're not all tired of um, me speaking so far. But um, when we go into, a, into the breakout groups, um, what we're going to do is we're gonna do two breakout groups in a row. The first one is to um, discuss essentially the purpose of the Crown Minerals Act. And the second one is the ways in which climate justice could be centered in how our um, mineral resource system is administered. Um, at each breakout group, I would like the group to nominate someone to report back because after each breakout group exercise, um, there will be an opportunity to report back. Um, so just my, uh, my last little bit of kind of um, me talking, which is um, just a background on why I've suggested this and um, what the Crown Minerals Act is. So the reason that I suggested this was because last year, the Ministry for Business, Employment and Innovation um, put out a discussion document, a consultation on a review of the Crown Minerals Act. And um, that consultation is over, so you um, no longer do have an opportunity to have your say on that one. But if this um, proceeds, then it will go out to consultation again in the form of a select committee. And it would be um, a really good opportunity for a lot of groups around to have a say on, you know, how um, oil permits are distributed and um, exactly how much of our natural resources can just be exploited. Um, so just a quick overview of the Crown Minerals Act. 
and then um, I think either Margaret or Alva or myself was going to post a link to a Google Doc um, where you can kind of a little bit more information will be. Um, so first, uh, the Crown Minerals Act is kind of the primary um, act that governs kind of the allocation of our natural resources, um, particularly like our mineral resources. So that means like our gold um, aggregate, which is um, kind of most commonly used for tar seal, um, little bits of ch like chipped stone, um, gold, all of the kind of minerals that are kind of deposited underneath um, our feet. And it provides for a number of things. Uh, for example, uh, there are programs that they can set up to distribute those resources. Um, there are royalty payments systems and schemes included in the Act. And also there are like specific reporting um, and information seeking um, things that come under the Crown Minerals Act for those who are um, mining. Um, in addition to that, there are a number of regulations and kind of um, national programs, which um, I won't go into because it is super kind of technical and we don't really have a lot of time. But essentially, the Crown Minerals Act um, governs how our mineral resources are distributed and who can take them. And um, one of the key, well, at least the first chapter of the review of the Crown Minerals Act was a discussion around the purpose of the Act. So the purpose of the Act, as stated, is, wait a second, I'm going to get out of here and this one here. Um, it is for the purpose of promoting the prospecting for exploration and mining of crown owned minerals for the benefit of New Zealand. So that seems pretty antithetical to um, our goals of moving away from oil and um, reducing exploiting our natural resources, which has a number of kind of climate change and climate justice um, implications. So for the um, first breakout session, I'm essentially going to ask you guys to rewrite the purpose of the act. And each breakout group can um, write in the document under here to um, kind of, if they want to like keep a record or um, take a couple of notes. But essentially just kind of going through the process of answering what a consultation question looks like. So do you think that it should be still promoting um, the prospecting for exploration and mining of crown owned minerals? Or is it about, or do you think that um, other words should be used? For example, administering or managing our, um, the mining of our crown owned minerals? And, um, or do you have another suggestion of a better way to phrase it, a different purpose that the act should have? Um, so I'm going to share this in the chat now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can do that. Um, does everyone feel comfortable with that? Um, so I guess like I'd be really keen to hear back from uh, what of the kind of each groups discussed. I'm going to um, see... And I think I was in breakout group room one and I know we didn't actually agree on anyone to report back, but um, maybe someone who has access to the doc want to put their hand up now. Olivia would be good, I'm too old. <laughs> Olivia, would you feel comfortable? Okay. Um, so, well, we focused mostly on it should change. So basically 
be changing the act to be about protecting our natural resources instead of um, instead of maybe exploiting them. And we have to emphasize why we are changing the resources and that there should be a further emphasis on is it Kaitia? Oh yeah, Kaitia Katanga instead of looking into stewardship and not just the ownership of minerals. So sort of the governance of. So and we also have to acknowledge that these resources are not, you know, they're not never ending, they're finite, and that there are already consequences to to mining them and that we should be careful of how we should use them. Did you maybe want to just quickly um, just round off with the reputation thing? Oh, yeah. um, the way if the, the act is written doesn't account for how this will damage our reputation. So, um, so New Zealand sort of promotes our country as being sort of clean, green and environmentally friendly in comparison to a lot of other countries. And so, but this act completely just goes against that. So by changing the act to actually fall in line with what we promote as a country will actually climate change for the good of the people, but also from those only looking at it from an economic standpoint. Cool. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, does breakout group, group breakout room group two have someone nominated to report back? I'm not sure what breakout group number we were, but assuming that we were to, if we weren't to, I'm sorry, you will be next. <laughs> so I'll just quickly report back. Um, so we did discuss um, sort of the four aspects of well-being, and we said that some of them are definitely more important than others. So both, uh, well, natural, human and social capital for us was at the forefront, whereas financial, um, in this instance, when we look at sustainability, definitely didn't have the same importance, even though there seems to be a lot of people who always have it at the forefront. And so one of the changes we definitely wanted to make as well, that we don't uh, promote minerals but rather protect or manage these um, and another thing that uh, sort of came up in our discussion that they were called were it is the crown minerals act so we just noticed there that by calling it crown minerals it sort of implies that the crown has more rights to these natural resources than let's say the indigenous people of the land um, so perhaps that would be something that we would want to change as well um yeah and then in terms of sort of like how climate justice would be centered around it um i think that's probably answered if we uh prioritize the natural environment um the human aspect of it and um social justice as well yeah and the third group, the last group. Yep, kia ora. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we kind of discussed quite similar things to the other groups. Um, I think one of the biggest things for us was kind of how the, um, the purpose had sort of more of a focus on short-term um, benefits for New Zealand. Um, and yeah, and so we kind of thought that, that it should be more focus on the long-term benefit and to have a long-term benefit that also means that we need to focus on sustainability um so actually we liked your word your suggestion of managing so managing the crown owned minerals sustainably for the long-term benefit of new zealand was kind of what we thought would be a good way to go um yeah and that and and also kind of yeah what what the other groups have said in, in the sense of sustainability in terms of socio and cultural um values I guess rather than just pure economic yeah cool awesome I think yeah they're all such great suggestions and amazing ideas and I hope you guys all feel pretty confident now that you'd be able to maybe in your communities or in your groups or even just as a 
um, individual be able to kind of see a little bit of a consultation document and be able to like have your say and imagine a better future and um, definitely, yeah, take part in that as a um, way of kind of um, structures and processes and institutions and rules around the way that kind of everything in our country works and um, kind of making sure that climate justice is centered when those changes are made. Um, I'm, I'm just conscious of time. And so I think we're just going to very briefly move on to the getting others involved, kind of how to do that. And um, then just uh, provide time at the end for questions. Is everyone okay with that? Cool. Just before you start on that, I had another question uh, from your session before, um, which was sort of like how to get in contact with, for example, the Climate Change Commission or just in general politicians. Um, how do you contact them? How do you make sure that they listen to us? And um, is there a way that you can invite them to the school and talk to them? And I think you might cover those anyway in your last part. Yeah, I'll cover that a little bit, but I'll make sure to um, start by really specifically um, answering that question, which is um, they can usually all be found online. So if you just uh, Google like Climate Commission NZ, it should come up with their website and they've got um, email addresses and phone numbers you can call. And it's the same with um, any MP, usually on Parliament's website, they'll have like a wee profile with their um, parliamentary email address and the their office number um, and kind of the ways in which you can kind of try and get them to listen to you more um, is kind of uh, what the next bit of the uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit about um, but while I'm figuring out how to share my screen um, I'll just give you guys an example of what I did personally for um, the Zero Carbon Act um, Select Committee hearing, which was that I brought in um, little vegan cupcakes um, that were completely like carbon zero in terms of like the emissions required to like get all the ingredients and stuff like that and brought them along and put icing on them and said like a zero carbon future can be quite sweet and um so that like there are definitely ways to um kind of publicize um exactly what you're um what you're trying to do and like kind of grab their attention but essentially the easiest way and the most effective way in my opinion of kind of getting politicians to listen is to get a number of people involved um, there's a quite famous quote from Robert Muldoon, who was um, a prime minister in, I think, the 80s. Don't quote me on that, though, um, which was that uh, he didn't really mind um, how much press coverage anything got. But if he got 12 letters from constituents, then he knew that there was an issue. So often, like, just kind of the sheer numbers is what's going to make a politician or a decision maker um, listen to you and take you seriously. So that kind of brings on to the next bit, which is getting other people involved. And so this is mostly, I'm just gonna use the case study of examples from the Zero Carbon Act and how we used um, kind of mobilization techniques to um, put pressure on the government during that campaign. Um, so the first thing we did was a lot of planning and um, this is kind of uh, the kind of, uh, I guess, brainstorm, our first timeline um, where we planned a launch of the act, which was um, outside parliament. Um, that was just like a, an attention grabbing thing to, to kind of put it on the medias and the government's um, kind of radar that this is a thing and that is going to happen. But there are definitely um, ways where you can show greater support. And one of them, of course, I think, in all of the school strike for climate kids will definitely 
be experts in this is to um, have a bit of a protest about it. Um, if you want a change, then um, that's a really easy activation um, and a way to kind of exercise your democratic rights um, to kind of show a lot of people, um, show how a lot of people really care about a particular issue. Um, the other option um, you can kind of, as like ways of getting people involved in the process is like, we always made a bit of an event out of everything. So um, down here, this photo on the left is a photo of us handing in our submission. We made like a, um, a little event out of it and invited MPs from all political parties and had a little bit of a, um, I guess, like, yeah, a attention grabbing moment um, when we handed ours in. And then another example of kind of a way to kind of, oh, Sorry, just while we're on the slide of the Zero Carbon Act, I just had a question on how effective the Zero Carbon is um, likely to be when it doesn't do much to restrict emissions in the farming sector. I think that is, uh, I, so it kind of is dependent, right? Like the Zero Carbon Act is just a commitment to make a plan. We've not made the plan yet. Um, uh, there'll be opportunities for us to all have our say, for example, in climate change commission consultations to, um, say, no, there need to be like strict limits on this. Or, um, if you have like particular climate justice or, um, ideas around how we should, or how much we should be doing in a particular sector, then there'll be an opportunity to have your say there. Um, which is why kind of participating and continuous participation is quite important. Um, the act is in no way um, and was never intended to be like the be all and end all. It is just an agreement to make a plan. That's how far we've got and it's not far, but we got there. Um, yeah. Um, but, in kind of getting to that plan, um, another thing we did was um, we made quite visual and um, collaborative submissions. So um, this photo up here is of a, um, I guess, a piece of material that we sent around to a whole bunch of schools. And so um, they all kind of signed on and that was again presented to MPs in quite a powerful moment um, that kind of grabbed their attention and kind of made them sit up and realize that a lot of kids actually really do care about this. Um, the other thing we did was we did a lot of speaking tours. We spoke at um, every opportunity we had. We went around the country um, and used kind of every I guess, conference and um, I guess community event to make sure that we were out there and that we were spreading the message. And that kind of mobilizes people to bring it onto their um, radar and maybe then they will engage and take part of the process. Um, another really cool activation tactic is to write an open letter. Open letters seem a lot less scary and daunting than um, writing a submission on a consultation. So often people, at least um, from us, we found that it was really key to have opportunities for people to sign petitions and open letters, and then also um, have open letters on behalf or signed by um, a whole range of NGOs and businesses. Um, to show government that it's not just these young people who are asking for this, but it's also um, Oxfam and Forest and Bird and World Vision and WWF and um, Lawyers for Climate Action and Te Fatu and all, like, all of the um, groups who did sign the letter. Um, the other thing is just kind of public visual stunts. So we did uh, many days where we... Um, would paint cities orange and um, go and chalk on the sidewalk and 
um, you know, it might just be as simple as, uh, you know, writing, you know, submissions close on the Zero Carbon Act on this day and um, kind of imploring people to vote that way. And um, also other visual signs, we did do a bike tour um, where we rode around the country as well, just to raise awareness of the um, submissions. The other kind of kind of cool way, and this is way more engaging way of bringing people in, is to host submission parties. So here is from Dunedin at the University of Otago last year for the Zero Carbon Bill Select Committee. And this one here is a school, I believe, in the Wired Upper, but um, I couldn't actually find the reference on that. So um, they also um, kind of had a wee submission writing party and um, threw this very wonderful thing. But um, kind of point being is that if you can kind of get even just 10 people in a room and make it a little bit fun, maybe order some pizza or make it do a little bit of baking or something and um, get everyone around and each write an individual submission, it can be really impressive for the government, um, especially because there is power in numbers and the, um, I guess the, the usual level of engagement that they get from the public is very low. So, um, for example, most select committees get around 200 submissions on them. And for the Zero Carbon Act, it was in the tens of thousands. So it kind of makes them, makes it feel like a very important issue and that there's a lot of public pressure um, if people are so engaged as to actually engage in the process. And it's, um, yeah, really easy to do that. In the Sorry, we just had a question. Um, could you just elaborate and explain again what the difference between writing submissions and writing letters is? So a submission is um, essentially a response to a consultation. So it's the government puts something out and then you respond to it. Um, whereas a letter is um, you writing something to the government and the government is then um, the obligation on them is to respond to it, right? So, uh, yeah, so it's, um, they're two different things, but the key difference is who initiates it. And also, um, very technically, they, they are required by law to at least consider the submissions. Um, they don't necessarily have to consider a letter. Um, so another tactic that we used as a way of getting people to kind of be engaged and submit on the Zero Carbon Act process was we ran a specific tactic called Elbow Your Elders, um, which we did in collaboration with School Strike for Climate. And essentially the kind of um, crux of the whole thing was that um, we were asking all young people to kind of go and have tea with their grandparents um, and to bring up the Zero Carbon Act and the need for action on climate justice and to encourage their grandparents to submit on the Zero Carbon Act. Um, we had a number of um, volunteers who also went around to retirement homes and um, went and elbowed um, elders that they elders that they weren't related to, but um, that was just a cool tactic in terms of um, getting a whole bunch of people to submit on one particular thing. Um, but yeah, I think kind of in summary, there are kind of key ways to um, kind of involve people and motivate them and get a little bit of, um, I guess perceived power behind um, what you're trying to change about a system. And um, so they're kind of grabbing the public's attention or the media's attention um, through general stunts um, or protests or things like that. Um, and then also organizing um, to provide kind of opportunities for people to 
um, submit in fun and exciting ways. Um, so that can be usually Gen Zero does like quick submit forms where it's just like ticking boxes. Um, or you could do community submissions or you can host submission parties or even run like a mini campaign to get young people to tell their grandparents to submit on um, a piece of legislation. Um, but yeah, I guess now um, open the floor for all of your questions. I'll quickly just read out one of the questions I got before. Uh, did you get much media coverage on the elbow your elders and if so how um we got a little bit but and uh, not that much and um in terms of how we went around getting um media coverage we often would write press releases um to kind of notify the press that we were going to be doing something um, but then also we would just get in contact with um, particular journalists who would we thought would be kind of um, on board with reporting on this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so I think that's where a lot of our kind of so, uh, our traditional media um, coverage came from. Are there any other questions? Um, I have a question about um, school strike for climate. So there's another one coming up in January. And I was just wondering, like, what are, what are some different ways that we can make more of a lasting impact from strikes and, like, actually um, making sure that, the, like, because it's a big thing when a strike happens, but then we, I feel like, there's a little bit of a lack of a follow-up from that to actually bring about change. And are there any specific tips that you can give us or specific methods that we should follow up from that? I think um, there are a couple. I think you guys know already, some already. Um, I know that at least in Auckland, you guys had a like educational like um, thing planned at the school strike that got canceled in, I can't remember what month, but it was due to COVID, um, where um, at the protest there was kind of planned that um, there'd be like little groups where you could learn how to do particular things. And I think that's a really cool way to kind of get people engaged because then they feel a little bit more confident um, in actually kind of going out and doing something. Mm -hmm. um, another way that is just kind of like a really good um, I guess process that I always try and keep in mind is that often um, people are excited in the moment and so letting them know what the next action is right then and there is really important so um, for example it could get very close to the strike and you could realize um, that there is um, like a petition or an open letter that um, you would like to put through and get everyone involved in or if there's a consultation that you think everyone should kind of come to a submission party on or if you have an idea around um, screening a movie or a documentary that is really educational and informative um, but just making sure that um, whatever your next action is that it's um, planned a little bit in, in um, beforehand so that at the um, school strike, you can say, hey, you really excited that you came here today, but also we've got this thing um, in a week's time or in two weeks time, if you'd like to come. Okay, thank you. I like your elbow and elder. I wonder if you could incorporate it in your school strike and encourage the students to take along a grandparent? That's a really good idea. Lots of grandparents are available during the day when you have your student strikes. Absolutely. 
are there any more questions? I've perhaps got an um, question sort of around quite often people tell you like the best thing you can do for our democracy or for making sure that your voice is heard is voting. And I guess that's one aspect, but sort of like if you compare it to all the civic participation and all the other ways to engage and make sure that your voice is heard and all the different ideas that you've presented us today. Um, sort of like if you compare the two, like would you say that one is more important than the other or do they complement each other or, yeah. Well, they're definitely like part of the same ecosystem, right? Like say for example, you vote on a whole bunch of people who are pretty antithetical to climate justice, then it's gonna, no matter how many times you submit on something, um, it's unlikely that things are gonna change and change in the way that you want them to. Um, but also on the converse, right? Like, um, I think there is kind of an undervalued importance in kind of just general civic participation. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Like we don't have basic civics education in um, New Zealand high schools, um, that there are kind of almost like, it seems so daunting um, and seems like you need to be an expert in something in order to have your say. Um, and also just, you know, that it's, um, it is kind of an ongoing process. So, um, kind of in order to rack up enough submissions to kind of equate to a vote, um, you might have to, you know, be writing, you know, 10 or 20, um, or have 20, 10 or 20 people, you know, writing a submission on a particular topic. Um, I kind of really enjoy civic participation though, mostly because it isn't, it, it, um, it isn't exclusionary in the sense that um, it excludes young people. There's no age limit to it, right? So um, there are really cool um, ways that um, uh, governments and councils around the world have got um, young people involved. I know that in, um, in a, I think it was Boulder, Texas, that um, their new, like, uh, their city council was going to um, build a new uh, park with a playground for the um, children in the area. And they actually went round to the local schools and um, essentially, like, made it like a little um, school project project where they all designed their own um, playground and then they used that as a basis of what they should build the playground like. So it, yeah, I think it can be very beautiful but it is an ongoing process and they're part of the ecosystem and I wouldn't be like don't vote or don't submit it kind of as part of a package. Oh, and then there was just a really good question from Jeslyn in the chat. What are the next steps after passing the Zero Carbon Act, uh, both for the government and for Generation Zero? Um, so in terms of the government, now they've got the nice, easy task of going through all of our systems and processes and laws and regulations and ministries and putting a climate focus on it making sure that they actually know how much emissions they're producing and how much um, emissions they need to reduce by by x date and how they're going to do it and it's going to be a huge task and a huge undertaking um hopefully with help and advice from the climate change commission but um yes yeah, so <laughs> their work is endless um i guess for generation zero We've been listed in uh, the Resource Management Act COVID-19 Fast Track Consenting Bill. So we're going to be responding to um, kind of the projects that are coming through that panel process and also um, working with community groups to um, kind of act as a conduit for their um, beliefs and making sure that climate justice is centered in these um, projects that are being consented. And then kind of also broadly just, uh, you know, our kind of day to day, we've got a, an election campaign going at the moment, um, but obviously that's going to wrap up soon. Climate change commission consultations are 
um, fast approaching and and still you know working um, at kind of the local level to making you know lobbying our local governments to um, kind of fix our cities. If there are no more questions, um, I think that's about time. So just quickly though, um, this is part of Amnesty International's um, Freedom Week and there are a whole bunch of other really cool workshops coming up. And so I believe that you guys are gonna get a follow-up email with mm -hmm. some slides from me and some just a um, little bit of information on um, some upcoming workshops that you're more than welcome to come to. And I think I would just like to thank you all for coming and listening to me. I know it's quite dry and quite boring and super technical, but it is important. I can promise you that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much all for coming. Yeah, I thanks, like Jen. Just say thank something. You. Great Good session. Uh, and, and just uh, to add, um, if, if you do one other thing, please spread the mahi. We, are, we have recorded this session because we know that um, it's not a session that everybody could attend, but you can share it with your school groups, you can share it with your elders, you can share it around the world if you like. And just so you guys know, our colleagues in Amnesty Canada so liked what we were doing here in Amnesty New Zealand that they are replicating this vision of putting youth voices um, front and centre. That, that's the power of amplifying youth voices, that they, they, get a, um, they get a global platform. So uh, the next session will be with Kira O'Regan, a fantastic uh, youth advocate. She started with us at high school at Marist College. She was also involved with Amnesty at University. She now uh, regularly attends UN meetings to discuss climate justice issues from a disability and um, indigenous rights uh, perspective. So another uh, world-class talent that we're presenting to you. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Jen, for your expertise and knowledge. Um, we are reliant on youth voices speaking out. So thank you for being part of that journey that we're taking together. And I look forward to seeing many of you at other sessions and to hearing how the sharing of this particular mahi works within your schools or universities. So thank you again. I would just like to say thank you also. I admire the energy of the young and I wish I could copy it at 86, but <laughs> anyway, it has been most interesting. And thank you again. Thanks, Mary. And for those of you who don't know Mary, we stand on her shoulders. She's been an activist and advocate for decades. Thank you. Thank Take you. care all. Have a great night and we'll see you on Tuesday for Kira's session. Bye-bye now. <laughs>